All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the research work plan. After a short break over the past month, we're now at module four and wow, halfway through the entire curriculum. For those of you who have stuck with us with the previous modules, thank you. And welcome to anyone joining in for the first time. My name is Anzal Rahman, one of the founding members of the Emirates Collaboration of Residents in Emergency Medicine, or ECRM for short. Hey guys, Salam alaikum. I'm Neda, Senior Technical Editor and Board Member at ECRM. So, thank you all once again for joining us for the fourth session under the Evidence-Based Medicine Grand Round Series. That's the EBM Grand Round Series, uh, the research work plan. As you all know, and to recap, the research work plan is designed as a modular series of lectures uh, that all together create a roadmap to conducting scientific research with content tailored towards EM residents in the UAE, but generalizable to all national and international residents, physicians, medical students, and interns interested in navigating research from concept to reality. As you may have read from our brochures, this initiative is made possible thanks to a collaboration with the team over at Best Evidence in Emergency Medicine, or BEAM. BEAM is an international emergency medicine knowledge translation program created by EM physicians for EM practitioners and has the mission and vision of being the most valid, reliable, and unbiased global source of current clinically relevant patient-centered evidence for EM physicians to provide the best clinical evidence to optimize patient care. We are incredibly grateful and proud to host some amazing physician researchers from the UAE and Canada who have put forth an invaluable effort to produce the content within this series. Hey everyone, this is Tasni Mohammed, the board member at Ekrem, and it's my pleasure to host this EBM module. Now, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please note that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on the Ekrem website. You will remain muted throughout the session to minimize the background noise. So kindly use the chat box if you have any question. The moderators will keep track of your questions and will present them to the speakers by the end of the module in the Q question and answer uh, live session. Uh, finally, if you experience any technical issues, contact me directly using the chat box and hope you have an informative and engaging session. Thank you, Tasneem. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our first speaker for the day, Dr. Marawan Zidane. Dr. Marawan Zidane is a senior research specialist in the research section at Dubai Health Authority or DHA. He is on a mission to dispel statistics myths and make understanding statistics accessible to researchers in DHA. Dr. Marwan earned his PhD degree in statistics from Western Michigan University, Michigan, United States in 2007, where he subsequently served as assistant professor for statistics. In 2009, he joined Wayne State University School of Medicine as assistant professor and worked as a biostatistician bio in the Michigan Research Center. Dr. Marwan Zidane used his skills to help the faculty, fellows, and residents in the research projects, including research design, data analysis, manuscript reviewing and editing, and publication. Dr. Marwan moved to UAE and joined UAE University as visiting assistant professor in 2014, where he taught several statistics courses for different majors. In 2018, he joined DHA as senior research specialist. Dr. Marwan is an editorial board member as statistician for Dubai Medical Journal and Dubai Diabetes Journal. Welcome, Dr. Marwan. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Marwan Zidan, and uh, my presentation today is about the uh, type of variables. Uh, in fact, this subject is very important uh, to researchers uh, because uh, knowing the type of the variable uh, determine, in fact, how we will uh, present and summarize and analyze the variable. And it has a big effect on the statistical uh, analysis section and in the results section. So first allow me to share my presentation. Let's start with the outlines of this presentation. By the end of this presentation, it's about 40 minutes, 
uh, we should be able to know the difference between qualitative and the quantitative variables, uh, able to recognize the level of measurements in the data, should be able to prepare our Excel sheet for data analysis, then uh, how we will present and summarize our numerical and categorical variables in our manuscript, and then uh, how we'll analyze and will present the most common statistical tests we use to analyze the numerical and categorical uh, variables. In fact, before I start with the type of the variables, uh, I always uh, prefer to start with these six basic and fundamental key definition or concepts in uh, research, not only medical research and any research. We need to know first what, uh, what do we mean by the population of the study? What is the parameter? And what's the census? And usually in research, we don't deal with that. First, what the population of the study? The population of the study is all the collection of all items or things under concentration in my research. And usually this is determined by the inclusion and exclusion criteria in your research. In medical field, mostly it is uh, uh, patients. Usually in this population of the study, we are interested in studying and making inference about parameters. What do you mean by the parameter? Parameter is a numerical quantity describes the population and it's calculated from the entire population. So for example, if our population of the study is colon cancer patient, and maybe I am interested in knowing what's the average lifetime for colon cancer patient in UAE. So this is a parameter of my study. If I want to know the parameter, which is a numerical quantity calculated from the entire population, I need to go to the all colon cancer patient in my example and follow them up and uh, calculate the average lifetime, which is, in fact, it's not possible because this is infinite population. So mostly the population parameter is unknown. The same if I want to know what's the prevalence of diabetes in UAE. I need to do the same. I need to collect the data from all uh, adults in UAE, and that's called census. Collecting the data from the entire population is census and it is very hard to be done. If you want to know the parameter, you need to do census and usually we can do this. So another example of parameter, for example, if I want to know what the prevalence of diabetes in UAE. The exact number of the prevalence is unknown. If I want to know what's the correlation coefficient between the body mass index and the total cholesterol. Again, I need to get the data from the entire population to know the exact value. Most of the times, I don't know this exact value. So I will do research and instead of dealing with the entire population, I just select a sample from the population. Sample is just a subset of my population of the subject, a group. A portion. This subset needs to be representative of the population. And instead of calculating the parameter from the entire population, I calculate the similar number, but from the sample, which is which we call it statistic. So instead of calculating the average lifetime for all colon cancer patients, we calculate the average lifetime for 100 patients. This is calculated from the sample using survey. So survey is collecting data from a sample. And we calculate the statistic from the sample. And we use these statistics, whether it's means or proportions or odds ratio or correlation coefficients or regression parameters, etc. We use these statistics to make inference and conclusion about the entire 
population. So this is very important to know that in our research, we have a sample of patients or a sample of the population. We calculate the statistics from this sample and we make inference about the population parameter based on these statistics in the sample. So once you determine your population and you selected your sample and you determine your design, you start collecting your data. Before we move to the data, this is just a few examples about the difference between the population and the sample. So for example, population might be all low birth weight infants, but the sample is on, uh, only low birth weight infants admitted to the NICU in 2015. Population might be all pregnant women, but my sample of the study will be a list of all pregnant women visited Latifa Hospital in 2017. Uh, another example about the parameter and the statistics, uh, the same example I just mentioned. Population might be all colon cancer patient. Sample is just 100 patients. The parameter, the average lifetime for the population of all patients, which is usually unknown, but we calculate the statistics, which is the average lifetime for the 100 patient, which is my sample. So this is statistic. And we will use this statistic to make inference about the population. So this is example about population, sample, parameter, and statistics. Now, these statistics in, back, in fact, we obtain it from our sample after we collecting the data. So first we need to collect the data and we need to see what type of data we have. Usually when we start collecting data about patients in medical field, you collect what's the gender, what's the age, what's the weight, what's the body mass index, what the symptoms, what the medication, what comorbidities, admission, ICU admission, uh, mortality, etc. So these are variables. How to distinguish between these variables? Really, in fact, the variables in general divided into two parts. Either qualitative variables, or sometimes we call them categorical variables, or quantitative variables, or sometimes also we call them numerical. I will start first with the qualitative or categorical variables. As the name, in fact, says, the value of the variable is name, is label, is a quality, uh, is a category. It's not a number, like gender. When, I, when you want to report the gender, you don't use number, you use male or female. So you use label or name or category. Uh, marital status, single, married, divorce, separated. Again, it's a label. Uh, nationality, Emirati, Omani, Saudi, American, etc. It's a label. So the value of the variable is a name or label or category. It's not a number. While if the value of the variable is a number, then the variable is a quantitative or a numerical. Like uh, what's the age of the patient? 55 years. Uh, what's your blood pressure? Uh, 120. Uh, what's your weight? What's your body mass index? Uh, these are numerical variables. So in general, variables divided either to qualitative variable or quantitative variable. And it, this is, as I mentioned at the beginning, is very important to know because based on that, I will determine how I will present the variable, how I will summarize the variable, how I will analyze the variable. There are certain techniques and methods to present and summarize and analyze the qualitative variable and another techniques and methods to analyze and present and summarize quantitative or numerical variables. 
In fact, each one of these two types can be divided also to two other types. Qualitative variables, both are quality, but there are two types of the qualitative variables, either nominal or ordinal. What's the difference between them? Very simple difference. In the nominal variable, the categories of the variable has no natural order, like gender, male, female. There is no category higher than another category. If you put male first or female first, that will not affect the variable. There is no natural order. The marital status, nationality. There is no natural order in the uh, categories of the variable. So this is called nominal, and this is the lowest level of measurement. A little bit higher level, which is still categorical or qualitative, which is ordinal. In the ordinal, the categories of the variable has natural order. Like, for example, pain level, mild, moderate, severe. You can decide or know which one is higher than another. Your educational level, elementary education, secondary education, undergraduate education, postgraduate education. So there is natural order in the categories, but they are still qualitative variables and categorical variables, but they have a little higher level than the nominal because we know the category and we know which is higher, which is lower. Uh, performance level, excellent, good, fair, and poor. Both of them, nominal and ordinal, are qualitative variables, but in the nominal, there is no natural order in the categories. In the ordinal, there is natural order in the categories. Is this important? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, some statistical analysis uh, for ordinal different from nominal. The other two levels, again, numerical also divided into two levels. Interval and ratio, both of them in numeric. The main difference between these two levels is the zero. The zero of the variable is if it is arbitrary, which is does not mean the absence of the variables, not absolute, then the variable is interval. Intervals means I can determine which one is higher, which one is lower, and can know the difference between them, but I can't make the ratio because the zero is arbitrary. A good example of that is the temperature. The temperature when you have a cup of water, 10 degrees and another 20 degrees, this is warmer, 20 is warmer than 10 and the difference is 10 degrees, but I can't make the ratio. I can say this is double this or this is half this because if you change to Fahrenheit, the ratio is no longer one to two. So because the zero is arbitrary, the zero does not mean the absence of the variable, the numerical variable considered interval. If the zero is absolute, which means the absence of the variable, like weight, height, power, if the weight is zero, then there is no weight. Height is zero, there is no height. The zero here is absolute, so the numerical variable considered ratio, which is the highest level of the measurement. I can know which one is higher, which one is lower, how much higher and how much lower, and I can make the ratio. Object with five kilo and another object 10 kilo, the 10 kilo is heavier, it's more by five kilogram and it is double the five kilogram. Whether it's in kilo, whether it's in gram, whether it's in pound, whether in any unit, it's still one to two or two to one. So I can make the ratio. And this is the highest level of measurements. So usually variables either qualitative or quantitative. According to the level of measurements, 
they uh, uh, divided into four levels. The qualitative, the lowest two levels which are nominal and ordinal. In the nominal, I only know the categories, no natural order. A little bit higher level, ordinal. I know the categories and I know which is higher, which is lower, but I don't know the difference. Meaning, the difference between mild and moderate is not the same as the difference between moderate and severe. The differences between the categories are not the same. A higher or the third level, which is a numeric, it's interval. I can say which is higher and which is lower by how much. 10 degrees or 20 degrees, the difference is 10 degrees and this is higher. But I can't make the ratio because the zero is arbitrary. The highest level of the measurement is the ratio. In the ratio, I know which one is higher, which one is lower, how much higher. And also I can make the ratio because the zero is absolute. So these are the four level of measurement. In fact, as I mentioned, for nominal and, nominal and ordinal, maybe it's important to know because sometimes there is statistical analysis for ordinal uh, different from nominal. But for interval and ratio, really it, that does not affect the analysis whether it's interval or ratio i will do the same analysis i will use t-test i will use anova i will use correlation and the regression for this numerical variable whether it's interval or ratio so this is the first <clears throat> i guess two or three objective of this presentation as just practice for the definition of for type of the variables what is the measurement level of the following variables remember qualitative is either nominal or ordinal quantitative either interval or ratio weight height body mass index temperature they are all numerical Way to high to body mass index, they are ratio because the zero is absolute. Temperature is a numeric but interval. Pain level as mild, moderate, severe is ordinal. Qualitative, ordinal. Nationality, qualitative, nominal. Age, quantitative or numerical ratio. Side effect, yes or no nominal qualitative nominal treatment group treatment one treatment two again nominal which is qualitative length of stay in numeric and it is ratio mortality yes or no qualitative nominal and a lot more similar to this variable so it's very important to know what's the type of the variable because that's when we decide how I will present and summarize and analyze my variable. Before you start analyzing these variables, you need to prepare your Excel sheet for your sample of patients. How to prepare your Excel sheet for the analysis? In your Excel sheet, you should have each patient in one row or each variable in one column. So if you have 100 patients, you have 100 row in your Excel sheet. If you collect 20 variables from each patient, you have 20 columns. Each patient in one row or each variable in one column. Now for the variables, if the variable is a numeric, you report the number. You report the age, you report the weight, you report the body mass index as a number. If the variable is categorical, you use a numerical code. This numerical code has no numerical meaning. You can't do addition and subtraction and multiplication on this number. It's just a code. So you can use one for male, two for female, or zero, one. Any two codes. One for mild, two for moderate, three for severe, and so on. For comorbidities, one for diabetes, two for blood pressure, three for cardiovascular disease, etc. 
So just a numerical code. And your Excel sheet at the end, it can be look like that. This is an example of, I guess I have 30 patients, but uh, I, I couldn't show all of the Excel sheet. This is the, the patient number. This is the first variable, food transit time in minutes. It's a numeric, I report the number. Treatment group one and two, categorical. Gender, male and female, zero, one. Side effect, yes or no, one or two. Will wait before, will wait after, will age. All of them in numeric, so I report the numeric value. So this, once you put the, uh, your data in this Excel sheet, it's very, very easy to uh, export this Excel sheet to the SPSS or any other software and analyze your variables. Now, for the second part of this presentation is about the descriptive and inferential statistics. After you collect and code your variables and prepare your Excel sheet, and you know which one is numeric, which one is categorical, then you start to describe your variables and analyze your variables. For the descriptive statistic, how to summarize and present your variables. If it is a numerical variable, you have two cases. If the variable is bill-shaped or normally distributed, then we present it as mean plus minus standard deviation. We say the average age of my patient is 50 years plus minus six years. Mean plus minus standard deviation. If the variable is skewed, is not bill-shaped, we report it as median range or interquartile range. Median of uh, age for my patient is 55 years, minimum is 30, maximum is 80 years. I report the median and the range. For categorical variable or qualitative, you only report the count and the person. I have in my sample, for example, my sample is 100 patient, 30, this is the count, followed by the person, 30 percent are female. 20, which is 20 percent, have diabetes. 10 or 10 percent admitted to the ICU. So if the variable is categorical, you only present it or summarize it as count and person. If it is a numeric, you summarize it as mean and standard deviation if it is bell-shaped, median and range or median interquartile range if it is skewed. This is how to summarize your qualitative and quantitative variables. How to present them? Again, for the categorical variable, qualitative, we can summarize the categorical variable using either a frequency table or bar chart or by chart. These are the most common. If it is a numeric, we use the dot plot or histogram or box plot. The most common one is the box plot. So you can't use the by chart for numerical variable. You can't use the box plot for categorical variable. So it's very important to know if it is categorical, I only can use these. If it is numerical, I can use histogram or box plot or dot plot, but I can't use by chart or bar chart. Uh, in the next slide, I just give an example about categorical variable, three methods ways to, to present it. This one to the left called the frequency table, the categories, the count, and the person. This uh, very example about pain level, categories of the pain level, no pain, mild, moderate, severe. I have 90 patients. Another way to summarize the same data is using the bar chart. A third way is using the by chart. Don't use more than one to summarize the same variable. Either the frequency table or the bar chart or the by chart for the variable. Don't use more than one. If you want to show the exact values, use the table. If you want to show the pattern, 
and the trend show the bar chart <clears throat> for the numerical variable these are the methods either histogram to the left or dot plot or box plot i would not go in detail on this because another presentation will describe that but these are the method how to uh, summarize your numerical variable or the graphs used in the manuscript to summarize the numerical variable the last part of this presentation is about the inferential statistics analyzing these variables categorical or numerical uh, meaning if your variable is a numeric you are dealing with means and the standard deviation. If your variable is categorical, you are dealing with count and percentages or prevalences. So in the inferential statistics, which is simply how to draw conclusion about the population parameter using the information in the sample. This is called inferential statistics, which is mostly either estimation or testing of hypothesis or test of significance. In the estimation, we want to estimate, if your response is a numeric, we want to estimate the average of this response and the standard deviation. So point estimation, we use sample mean for the numerical variable, and we use sample proportion for the categorical variable. We say the prevalence of diabetes in UAE is 25%, for example. So this is sample proportion. I will use the sample proportion to draw conclusion about the population proportion. I say the average lifetime for colon cancer is four years from my sample, and I will use this number to be generalized to the entire population. This is point estimation. Also, I can construct the 95% confidence interval for the mean, if my response is a numeric, and the 95% confidence interval for the proportion, if my response is categorical. The other part, part of inference is test of significance. Again, it's very important to know what's my response. Is it categorical or a numerical? Because that will determine what test I will use. To decide what test I will use, I need to know, sorry, is my response a numeric or categorical? Is my predictor a numeric or categorical? How many groups I have in my design? I have only one group or two groups or more than two groups. If my response is a numeric, is it bill shaped or is cube? Is the sample size is large? sample size is small. All of these factors affecting the test that I will use for my analysis. So I tried in the last slide, just to summarize the most common test of significance we use, whether my response is a numeric or categorical. If I have one group or two groups or more than two groups. If I only have one group, is it true that the average lifetime for colon cancer is four years in UAE? In this case, my response is lifetime, which is a numeric. I check if it is a bill shape, I will use one sample t-test. If it is a skewed, I will use Will Coxon sandrang test. If my response is categorical, I want to test if it is true that the prevalence of diabetes is 25 percent in UAE. I will use the chi-square test or one sample Z test. If I have two groups, I'm comparing two medications, and my response is a numeric. I am comparing the uh, the average recovery time between these two medications. So the response is a numeric recovery time three days, four days, seven days, eight days. I will check the response. If it is bill shaped for the two groups, we will use two sample t-test. If one of the groups is skewed, the average, uh, the recovery time, then we'll use the non-parametric test, man with the test. 
if I want to compare categorical response between these two groups, uh, the recovery rate between these two medications, or the side effect between these two medications, I can use either chi-square test or odds ratio, a relative risk or risk reduction. In fact, the risk reduction, we have absolute risk reduction, which is the difference between the two proportion, or the percent risk reduction. If you have more than two groups, if you're comparing three different medications, look at your numerical variable. If your response, sorry, if your response is a numeric, check. Is it bell shape for the, all the groups? If it is bell shape, we use analysis of variance or ANOVA. If one of the groups is skewed, we use the non-parametric test cross curves. If you are comparing the proportion between these three or four groups, we use the chi-square test. So these are the most common uh, tests we use uh, in our uh, manuscript. Not all, but the most common. And you can see that the, to determine what test we have, we can use, we need to know what's our response. Is it numeric or categorical? If it is a numeric, is it per shape or skewed? In fact, uh, I tried to cover the most important things about the type, types of variables by introducing what are the type of variables, what are the level of measurements, why we need to know that, how to prepare your Excel sheet for the data analysis, and then how to present and summarize and analyze your variables based on whether it's numeric or categorical. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not all the tests we will use, but this is the most common one. These are my references, and thank you very much. I hope that you uh, enjoy this presentation and you, it's uh, beneficial for you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Marwan, for that incredibly informative lecture. I honestly feel that even if you had some familiarity with some of these concepts, the presentation and dissection of each type of variable was pretty methodical. So it's likely to solidify your understanding of data, or at least it definitely has done for me. Um, also worth commending is the fact that you took something that residents, myself included, often dread as a topic of study since it is considered conventionally to be a bit dry. Uh, but fortunately, you stuck to the important bits of information in a clear and concise way and covered the fundamentals of what you need to know going into research. So up next, we have another very important lecture on literature review delivered today by Dr. Sunil Obadie. Uh, you all know him from the very first module in the research work plan curriculum, where he spoke about why we should pursue research in the first place. Dr. Sunil is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and HEI, that's Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster's University. Uh, he's a founding member of BEAM since 2005 and the research lead for the EM researchers of Niagara, which is Emron, and Niagara Research Campus of McMaster's University Medical School. He works as a staff position within the Niagara Health emergency departments, as well as a guidelines methodologist with the Canadian Association of Emergency Medicine, that's the CAEP, and the Society of uh, for Academic Emergency uh, Medicine Guidelines for Reasonable and Appropriate Care, the ED, that's the SAEM GRACE groups. Uh, that's my quota for acronyms for today. Uh, congratulations and welcome back, Dr. Sunil. Hello, my name is Sunil Yupati. I'm an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. And it's my pleasure today to present EBEM, e BEAM and ECRAM Grand Rounds on Literature Reviews and Emergency Medicine Research. Our objectives today are to consider why we do literature reviews in emergency medicine research, or any research for that matter. 
Uh, the Prisma frameworks for conducting literature reviews will make comments about that. How to conduct a literature review project in its various steps. Hierarchies of literature review, including narrative reviews, scoping reviews, systematic reviews with meta-analyses, and then networks and individual patient data meta-analysis. We'll have some comments about that. And finally, publishing literature reviews and summaries as well. By way of disclosures, I've been a member of the Beam faculty since inception in 2005 till currently. I'm also a methodologist using the grade processes for the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine's Guidelines for Reasonable Appropriate Care in the Emergency Department since 2019. And I'm also the research lead for the Emergency Medicine Research of Niagara. So where do systematic reviews fall on the pyramid of evidence? They fall about in the middle uh, where you, you, on the success pyramid that was pioneered out of McMaster under Brian Haynes' tutelage and what have you. Uh, these are in the syntheses category, uh, slightly below clinical practice guidelines, but above primary studies. The goals of systematic reviews and literature reviews are to kind of define the field in terms of what the state of the union is, perhaps identify gaps in research or evidence that need to be filled with future research, establishing which studies and methods are most relevant to different study designs, perhaps on the questions that you're interested in, and then justify the necessity for this current study and literature review and clarify what the contribution of your review is going to be in terms of the current uh, understanding of knowledge and outlining future research priorities. So why literature reviews? There's two reasons you're going to do a literature review. The first one is easy. This is a literature review for another project. So you're using it to support another project. So you might do a limited literature review for specific relevant information to contribute to your study designs, to your methodologies being used to justify the introduction of your article and whatever, if you're doing a randomized trial or a diagnostic test result or a clinical decision rule, confirms clinical equipoise. Certainly you want to avoid any inadvertent repetition or blatant plagiarism. If you need it for justifying the grants that you want to write to support your projects or research ethics board applications, you need a good review that supports that. And finally, you might use some of these resources in the introduction, the methods and discussion for your final manuscripts of whatever study design you're going to do. The second project is a literature review as the research project. So the review is the product. So this usually involves having more comprehensive searches for all relevant information to your question of interest, synthesizing all of that available knowledge and then attempting to pool intervention effects, perhaps for statistical precision and magnitude of impact of the intervention you might be looking at. You might explore indirect comparisons using a network meta-analysis, more on that later. And finally, you might explore individual patient level outcomes as well, more on that later. Just uh, by way of background, the quality of systematic reviews in emergency medicine literature has been lacking. It was analyzed with a group of 30 some odd ran randomly selected systematic reviews from the EM literature scored with the scoring tool that you see there, the OQAQ. And the conclusions at the time were that the results of the study showed that reviews in emergency medicine generally have significant methodological flaws and uh, that limits the validity of their report. So that's a 20 year old study and it begs to be redone to see if things have improved in the last 20 years. As mentioned in that time, the PRISMA standard, so the preferred reporting for items or systematic reviews and meta-analysis, or PRISMA is the mnemonic, has been evolving for two decades now to account for these methodological and other uh, shortcomings in systematic reviews. So you can see there's a general write-up here on the web page for PRISMA. And then here, depending on what kind of study you're doing, uh, systematic review diagnostic tests for harms, you can, there's individual patient data, network and meta-analyses, scoping reviews. So whatever your systematic review design style is going to be there will likely be a prisma extension that you should be following as a checklist to uh, to understand the steps that are needed to be done to create a thorough and trustworthy systematic review or meta-analysis the first step of always once you're building your team is you have to engage a librarian it's essential these people are fantastic resources to help you refine your search strategies for electronic databases help you define your mesh headings and so on and so forth uh, they might find other sources of information that you're not traditionally used to looking at and finally they save you a lot of time and time is a precious commodity when you're doing research so these people are worth their weight in gold if they're part of your team when it comes to actually searching, searching the literature, Annals of Emergency Medicine had a four-part series on this again about 20 years ago on various uh, electronic databases, so Medline and you know tips and tricks about how to set your search parameters and then what are the other databases available out there. But again, a librarian helps you set, settle all that. Um, the search parameters for your lit review are generally going to be based on your PICO question, which we've covered in a previous session. 
Electronic searches may involve bibliographic databases, so Medline, CINAHL, LILACs, and Base Biosys in the Cochrane Library as well. You might go to citation databases like Google Scholar, Scopus Web of Science. You might also want to look up trial registries like clinicaltrials.gov if you're looking at interventions for some disease of interest. You can also partake in manual searches, so you go through the references lists of the retrieve article, and that's called pearl growing, it's a term for it. And then you can look at other sources of what's called grade literature, so conference abstracts, uh, thesis dissertations, government reports, various websites, and even talking to experts in the field to find literature or information that may not be published that's relevant to the question that you're trying to answer. So the search terms themselves, like I mentioned, the PICO elements of your research question will define your search strategy. The medical subject headings or MESH in, in Medline are best developed with, again, the help of a librarian because they'll know how to explode the features and capture as many different uh, initial articles that may be eligible for inclusion in your lib review as possible. You want to save your search strategy for sure because uh, you, you want to make sure that if somebody else does your search when you publish your article, uh, perhaps in an appendix, they should be able to get the same results. So it's it's speaks to transparency and reproducibility and trustworthiness of the work that you're doing. Pearl growing, as I mentioned, it starts with one article, um, maybe in print or maybe electronic, and then as you start scanning the reference lists for more, refer more relevant sources, you find articles, so you pull them, and then you scan through their reference lists and pull more and more and more, and you can repeat this as many times as necessary until you finally uh, have reached saturation, so that's described in multiple resources. It can be done electronically as well. So anybody who's familiar with the Medline databases on PubMed, uh, you can see along the right-hand side, as soon as you found the article you want, then they talk about related articles here on the right-hand side, and then maybe similar ones that have been cited as well. So that's a way to digitally uh, pro grow as well, or snowball or whatever you want to call it. So uh, using citation managers is an important tool to help you with your lit review if you can. They can be very useful to store your articles, uh, create your personal library for key articles as your life in research goes on and your areas of interest continue to build. So you just have them all stored there, including the citation information. Um, you avoid duplications because, again, as you do different projects, you might search and search multiple times over a lifetime and keep pulling up the same articles. Whereas if you have this all in one master library for yourself, then you can avoid that unnecessary waste of time and effort. Um, some of these programs will actually auto format for you depending on the journal of interests reference list requirements so the APA style of listing references or the Vancouver style or whatever it is the journal that you want to submit to request this will take care of that for you as well. So there's a couple of products that are, that are free one is called Mendeley the other one is called Zotero the other ones uh, require some cash payments so one is endnote and refworks with regards to these latter two if you work with an institution or a university or a hosp big hospital they may cover the costs for you or give it to members of those institutions for free the third step is that once you've got your citation manager going, you're going to also want to have some sort of an online support system for your systematic review meta-analysis. In the old days, it used to be all paper-based and you keep files and you keep data abstraction sheets around and hope that they don't get lost and all such things. But now this stuff can all be done in a digital platforms and there's multiple out there. So there's one called Kadima. I have some experience with Covidence. I've not used Distiller. Ryan is another one. There's many of them out there. They all have different strengths and weaknesses and levels of complexity with regards to text mining and what have you. And some of them are free and some of them cost a little bit of money or a lot of money, depending again, what you have available to you in terms of funding from your institution, from grants or what have you. So Cole and all, and all looked at this in a few years back and did a comparison of all of these 14, 15, oh sorry, 22 different software packages down the light side, left side, Kadima, Colander, Covidence, Distiller, and on and on and on it goes, and looked at all of these capabilities and what have you, and they determined that it seems like the Kadima website is most uh, user-friendly. I have no experience with that, so I can't speak to that. Step four, if you're going to do a systematic review or a meta-analysis or beyond that at higher levels of performance, then you're going to want to do critical appraisal of studies. And this is a critical step. Uh, it's important to realize, this is a mistake I see all the time, that if authors have used reporting standards like Prisma or whatever to document what's in their studies and what have you, it doesn't mean that they're high quality uh, reports for the various domains that are in these tools. It just means they've been reported. It doesn't mean that the studies have done their elements well. So you shouldn't be confusing reporting standards with quality appraisal instruments. It's a mistake I see all the time. So there are general critical appraisal instruments for 
broad study design. So user's guide for the medical literature first published in the 90s in the Journal of American Medical Association, then picked up by the CASP checklists. The Cochrane Risk of Bias uh, in the systematic reviews is a good general tool as well. There may be some more design specific ones. So for randomized control trials, there's the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. Uh, for non-randomized trials, they have the Co Cochrane Robin I, so Risk of Bias in Non-Randomized Study I don't know what the I stands for. Uh, AMSTAR 2 is a tool that's for interventions. Pedro is for observational studies of interventions. Quadus is for diagnostic tests and clinical decision rules. And then the check and the cheers lists are for economic evaluations. And on and on it goes. Like depending what studies you include into your systematic review, you're going to want to have the right critical appraisal checklist for that. Where do you get into trouble with some of these reviews? Uh, this is just one element, which is conflict of interest when industry sponsors. Systematic review is a meta-analysis. This was looked at quite interestingly by Andy Jorgensen back in 2006. And they found that uh, industry-supported reviews of the drugs uh, are generally less transparent from a methodological perspective. They're limited and have more flaws. And inevitably, because the drug company is paying for the review, they find conclusions that suggest that the drug is good for the interest, for the disease of interest that they want to sell medications for and make uh, make money. So those are commercial risk of bias that you want to avoid. There's many other risks of bias, but this one's been done looking at financial industry support. So in 209, Grant did a systematic review of systematic reviews on review articles and found that uh, there was a number of different styles and levels of reviews out there with all different types of strengths and weaknesses. 14 is what they found using a framework that they've called SALSA. I don't need to explain what that is. Um, overall, there's a lot of overlap between the different review styles anyway. There's a little bit more in this and a little bit less of it in another. Methodologically, they're not that different, uh, but from a rigor of development, there certainly is a hierarchy and a progression. We'll go through that a little bit right now. So you can look that up if you need to. The key ones that learners and early researchers, faculty, what have you, are going to want to be aware of um, is narrative reviews. And this is the lowest level of review, a traditional literature review or narrative review, whatever it is. The question is generally broad in scope. The search strategy may be unspecified and undefined, and it may be biased. The study selection is often undefined and unspecified with, without proper inclusion exclusion criteria, and they may be biased. The evidence appraisal may be there, may not be there, so it may be absent completely and, or not done well. The evidence synthesis may or may not be structured properly. It may be qualitative in nature, which is okay if, uh, if that's the goal of the study. Uh, and the inferences and conclusions, they're not necessarily evidence-based. Generally, these are the types of reviews where the author has wants to tell a story and cherry picks the evidence that they want to use to support their narrative. So there's no clinical equipoise here. It's, you know, there's an agenda perhaps, and maybe an author has their own conflict of interest, professional or otherwise, and they want to tell a story with a review article and they pick some articles to support their position. That's what it is. The next level up are scoping reviews. The general purpose of these are to identify and map all the evidence available on any given topic. It doesn't necessarily have to be a focused question. It can be just, just of a general landscape of the literature in a certain topic in emergency medicine or wherever. They tend to start with the RxC and O'Malley frameworks, and these have been developed further with uh, standardized PRISM extensions. You can look at the TRECO article from 218 on that. Uh, th they generally are not enough to change clinical practice because they don't necessarily have quality-based evidence assessments, pooling of data. They might be just exploratory needs assessments to define where the gaps in the literature are on a given topic, especially in areas that are a bit more esoteric in your field. An example of this, um, again, when you look at systematic versus scoping reviews, uh, is a, here's a nice table that compares all of that. So the narrative review or traditional literature review has no protocol, no registration in Prospero, which is an international a data registry for review articles. There's no explicit search strategy. They don't use standardized data ex, uh, extraction forms. Risk of bias assembly for quality is absent. And the synthesis of findings from individual studies is completely absent. Now, in scoping reviews, you might have a protocol. Ideally, you should. Um, again, you may not register it. You should have a good search strategy. And you know, if you're extracting information, ideally, uh, you should have them standardized. But again, a scoping review doesn't necessarily have critical appraisal of the included articles and pooling extraction of data and pooling of elements, whereas a systematic review of meta-analysis must meet all of these things to be qualified as systematic review for publication. So here's an example of a scoping review of some students and I were involved with just got published uh, earlier this year. Uh, this is a topic in emergency medicine, which is the care of uh, sexual gender minority, so LGBTQ populations in ER settings. And there's a really a lot of 
missing research on this uh, important population, vulnerable population who comes to emergency department. So our group, we did a scoping review to see what was actually out there. And we found a bunch of things around HIV testing uh, in population health, reasons why these these people don't come to the ER setting because of discrimination issues or triage problems or just a lack of awareness and knowledge of unique medical issues uh, in this population. So we published this scoping review and laid out a research agenda going forward uh, to take care of, um, to address this because it's lacking. And that's what a scoping review was good for. So systematic review, as you climb the ladder of review hierarchies, uh, the question ideally should be quite focused. So, you know, what is the benefit of inhaled steroids for treating mild to moderate asthma in the emergency department? That's a very focused question. So that is something that lends itself to systematic review, assuming there's a lot of trials that address this question and historically there have been. So the search strategy should be comprehensive, comprehensive and explicitly described using the preco parameters of the statement I just made. The study selection should have criteria saying, okay, we want randomized trials, we want steroids versus placebo or steroids versus another active comparator. The outcome of interest will be discharge rates, admission rates, and recidivism within three weeks, perhaps, and so on and so forth. And the uniform application of these criteria for all the included statistics should be the same, ideally done in duplicate. You might actually do uh, agreement statistics on the search and, and extractions themselves. When you do the evidence appraisal, you should use a, a validated tool like we've talked about uh, those designs for uh, previously. And then uh, when you synthesize the evidence, it could be quantitative. So if you're pulling numbers out of individual studies and you want to pool them all together into a pooled effect estimate or meta-analysis, that would be fine. Or it could be qualitative in nature as well, depending on what kind of things you're comparing. And the inferences and conclusions here, unlike a narrative review, should be evidence-based based on all of the steps that you just completed above. So what are the other fundamentals? You know, you should use a recipe, follow a handbook. There's lots of them out there. Uh, Cochrane's got a very good handbook. It's very rigorous and they use the grade methodology for such. Uh, you got to develop a protocol. You, you probably don't need REB approval because generally you're looking at public domain evidence and it doesn't have any impact on patient care or privacy. So you may not need to get REB approval, but you should register it with Prospero just to let the world know that you're looking at this topic in case somebody else is doing it at the same time or if you go to prospero and figure out somebody's already doing it or have they're almost finished you don't need to do your study and waste any time setting up an electronic systematic review platform uh, we've talked about those before covidence distiller kadima whatever whichever one you want to use the structured literature search we've talked about using a library to help you with your search strategies based on the pico parameters your mesh headings and so on and so forth Eventually, you get to a point after you go through titles and abstracts, you're going to pull down full articles for full text review and extract data. This should ideally be done in duplicate uh, to make sure you have uh, proper data abstraction agreement. And then you can pool data with meta-analyses, either aggregate with networks, individual patient data, whatever elements of uh, the unit of analysis is. So systematic review with meta-analysis is the next step up. And this is where you're pulling numbers out of individual studies. And you know, this is from an article from uh, Zed et al. in 2003 in the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine. So, so here you have a bunch of articles and you know, here's the raw numbers that go into this table that was generated using say RevMan or some other similar meta-analysis software. Uh, here's your raw numbers. It spits out your forest chart here, the percent weight, the confidence intervals, your total pooled effect estimate is here. It'll give you a I squared value or some sort of metric for heterogeneity. These all look very similar and what have you, but these are a bit more all over the place. So you've got more heterogeneity in the primary outcome. I'm not going to get into details of homogeneity and heterogeneity. We can cover that another time, but uh, certainly these software programs can give you the forest plots if you're doing a quantitative meta analysis. Um, I'm a, I admit I am a grade scientist trained in various workshops and we've been using grade in our SAEM uh, grade guidelines products. So I am familiar with this. There are other frameworks out there on how to do systematic reviews, but I'll talk about grade briefly. It is becoming the most internationally recognized framework for systematic reviews and clinical practice guidelines, uh, fully endorsed by the WHO and the Cochrane collaboration now uses grade for their systematic reviews. There is an explicit step-by-step -step approach on how you create these review programs. There's online support for free using the grade pro platform. We'll look at that again in a second. They have very clear criteria for upgrading or downgrading evidence. And you enter all of these things into the grade pro table for your study. And then you can print this all out later. And um, it's very explicit and trustworthy for your audience how you made your decisions on evaluating evidence. You can have grades spit out summary tables for you, summary of findings and summary of evidence. They're slightly different. I'll show you examples of both of those. And you can use these in formulating clinical practice guideline recommendations. So some colleagues and I, we wrote about grade uh, a couple of years back. 
in uh, use for clinical practice guidelines. This is a diagram you'll see from the GRADE website and many other GRADE-based articles. The top half of this panel is the system aggregate evidence. So I'll only show you that. So you start with a panel who then generate a question with PICO parameters, you select the outcomes of interest, you rate their importance, you start doing literature searches, you evaluate all of the studies you want to keep and start extracting data, you do your uh, evidence assessments, and at some point you're finished with your systematic review. And if you want, you can then move it down and finish off the elements of the evidence decision framework to create clinical practice guideline recommendations, and then publish them both separately. It's too big to put them all together, so ideally you should have two publications if you're going to do this. Evidence quality assessments. So this is where critical appraisal becomes important. Uh, by way of disclosure, I have a master's degree and my thesis project was on the validity of critical appraisal tools. And it's really important to use these things properly to differentiate low quality evidence, which should not be in reviews or meta-analyses or clinical practice guidelines versus high quality stuff, that information that should be included uh, for pooling uh, data and making conclusions. Uh, again, there's different tools out there, some of which I showed you earlier on for risk of bias uh, for the study designs that you're going to be looking at. Just be mindful that you want to defend the use of your tool properly and you want to report on its psychometrics. So, because sometimes the using using different tools for the same body of evidence, the number of studies you're going to look at, can actually generate different results. And this is brilliantly demonstrated by Peter Juni about 20 some years ago um, on treating a VTE, so venous thromboembolic disease with unfractionated heparin versus low, low molecular weight heparin, different, different treatments became dominant or superior to the other, and it all had to do with how you picked the studies, which tool you used, so not what was actually the better agent for treating uh, blood clots. So you might want to report your agreement scores as well for the appraisals, it's just more information to enhance trustworthiness, and you can put all of that stuff in an appendix if you need to. So the Grade Pro, if you're going to use Grade, uh, you can sign up for free. It manages all of your individual studies. So you just put them in line by line, each study, and then you put in your evaluations for ratings and evidence up and down how you want to do it. It'll collect all of those ratings into one global synthesis eventually. It can generate your summary statistics for you if you put in the raw numbers and a, and a meta-analysis for such. You have summary of evidence and summary findings tables. So here's a summary of evidence table. So this is one for otitis media treatment of children with antibiotics. So that's relevant to us in emergency medicine. So here's a bunch of outcomes, pain at 24 hours with five trials, pain at two to seven days, 10 trials, hearing losses with four randomized trials, more on hearing, vomiting, diarrhea, and rash. So the categories of downgrading evidence are limitations in the methodology, inconsistency of the results, indirectness of the results, imprecision, publication bias. I'm not going to go through the details of this. This is These are multi-day workshops if you want to learn how to use grades, so I can't cover this in three minutes. Uh, and then the number of people who are in placebo antibiotic groups, the final relative risk of the pooled data for the five studies from there, overall numbers here, and then the quality of evidence reporting is high in this particular outcome, high in this one, moderate, moderate, and moderate for the last three or four. So a different way to demonstrate this is a summary of findings tables, which is a little more clinically friendly. Uh, so, you know, here are the outcomes again, pain at 24 hours, pain at two to seven days, hearing changes, from uh, a surrogate on tympanometry at one month, three month, and bombing dash diarrhea, the round numbers from the trials, the effect estimates re represented here as a relative risk, the number of participants, the quality of the evidence, and then maybe some other comments. So it's slightly different from the SOE table. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to present this data, but uh, if you present either of them, I'm sure they'll be fine for the audience. So a network meta-analysis allows for analyses that are based on both direct and indirect comparisons. And that's the difference between a meta-analysis, which only can rely on direct comparisons of intervention A or drug A versus intervention B or drug B for disease X. Um, this one allows for different things. We'll describe that later. So there is a structured methodology for in, uh, indirect comparisons. Again, we're using the PRISM extensions. So this is a network, and this is a diagram taken from Lauren Westerfer's article from Annals of Mercy Medicine a couple of years ago. So the idea here is, you have all of these different medications or interventions, it doesn't matter what it is. So the size of the dot indicates how many studies have addressed this particular intervention. So let's say drug A versus drug D. The thickness of the line shows that there's a lot of trials here. So the thicker the line means there's a lot of head-to-head -head comparisons of A versus D for condition X, it doesn't matter. Now there's not as many for drug C versus D. So there's a thin line here, C versus B, thin line, uh, one line there, thin line between C, B and D, thin line between A and B. There's a lot more trials for whatever reason of A versus E. And when, when you come down here, so like I said before, 
the size of the bubble for the intervention of interest is the number of trials that address that intervention. The thickness of the lines is how many direct trials that you found comparing one versus the other. Now this hashed line here though, G versus A, means that they cannot find an actual trial that looked at A versus G. However, based on all the mathematics of this model and network, they were able to impute a mathematical effect or a potential clinical effect of A versus G. And that's what a network meta analysis allows you to do. Make not just guessing, but evidence-informed, educated calculations of what you think A versus G would look like if a trial was actually done. So they can be useful. The final group of reviews to know about is individual patient data meta-analysis. So the structure of the unit of analysis here actually are the patients, not the study outcomes at the aggregate level, but you have to contact the authors for these the studies that you've included and you want all the individual patient data because you might want to look at different subgroups or whatever the case may be depending on what uh, your uh, question of interest is for your review so it'll you can explore different questions subgroups that were not looked at in the primary review maybe based on age gender comorbidities and what have you you have to be able to get the individual patient data from the authors uh, they should be willing to share that hopefully you can get that done so uh, one of my students and i many years ago we wrote a summary of one of these individual patient data is looking at the benefits of otitis media in children. And what these authors looked at is age cutoffs and one year of unilateral versus bilateral otitis media and otitis media with otorrhea. So in the primary studies, in a previous review, none of those particular subgroups had been analyzed. But when they did individual patient data from those included studies, they were able to identify that any child that has bilateral otitis media, or a child under two that has unilateral otitis media, or any child with otitis media with bilaterea would benefit from antibiotics. And they were able to get this because they were able to look at individual patient data outcomes in these subgroups of interest that were not originally reported in the aggregate study level trials. So this is a useful thing if you can get that data. Getting close to the end, the last steps of getting a review done or publishing it. And if you want to know any rules around publishing any study design, you can just go to the Equator Network and you'll see for systematic reviews, they essentially say follow the Prisma guidance and the extensions of whatever study design you used, a network, uh, IPDMA, uh, diagnostic test, whatever. And then you can report it according to that. There is an extension of what's called the SWIM framework. So these are systematic reviews without meta-analysis that were published in BMJ. These are just nine extra little things that you want to make sure that you follow when you write up your report for publication to enhance openness, transparency, and trustworthiness. So you can use the SWIM criteria as well as Prisma criteria if you like. Finally, you want to get it out there. You've published it and you want to get it out there to the world to see the great work that you've done. So you can obviously do your primary publications in your peer-reviewed medical literature. You can also get second-order peer reviews, so SOPERS, uh, which is what we do with, with the BEAM course, with journal clubs, newsletters, uh, various uh, big emergency medicine journals have series where they do snapshots and uh, second-order peer reviews. So here's one I did on uh, back pain, vertebral fracture, red flags back in 2015. Um, Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, the Academic Emergency Medicine Journal has something called Hot Off the Press series, which a bunch of my friends, Justin Morgenstern, Ken William, <laughs> Ken Milne, and what have you from previous BEAM courses, they, they, they feed this series a lot. Manchester has something called the Best Bets as well for the European audience and whatever. So these things exist online uh, around the world. And these are a nice way to read perhaps a two-page summary of a big systematic review rather than the whole article itself if you're a time-constrained cl clinician. So to summarize, lit reviews are an important part of clinical research improvement and for medical research overall. A lit review should follow international standards for methodology and trustworthiness using the PRISMA statements. You want to get a librarian early involved to help you with your search strategies. They're there to help you, especially with student projects and resident projects, and they will save you a ton of time and avoid any mistakes in missing key literature otherwise if you try to do this yourself in a digital space only. You should use a digital online support program uh, like GradePro or Covidence or Distiller or Kadima or whatever you want. It just makes organizing your activity easier, especially if you're collaborating with uh, with authors in different parts of the world. Uh, everybody can just sign on to the platform from different areas and then you're all working off the same workspace, which is very convenient. Using validated critical appraisal tools is essential if you're going to try and filter out poor quality evidence versus high quality evidence. 
uh, if you're doing a systematic review meta-analysis network or IPDMA for sure. And then finally, publishing and disseminating your work following the reporting standards as we showed you in the Equator Network is important. And of course, you should finish your article with saying, okay, here's what our, the research shows in our review so far, and here are the next steps for future research groups to pursue for the clinical disease of interest that you are uh, publishing on. So we'll stop there and take any questions during the live session. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Sunil, for that lecture and for that in-depth step-by-step guide on how to approach conducting literature reviews. I must say there are quite a few resources you mentioned that are worth checking out that may, in fact, make the overall process less daunting and more user-friendly than often presumed to be. That wraps up our lecture sessions, which means it's now time to move on to our live Q&A segment. May I please request both our speakers, Dr. Marwan and Dr. Sunil, to kindly switch on their microphones or videos. And dear audience, if you haven't done so already, please feel free to type your questions related to the topics discussed today in the chat box, and Hanzen and I will read them out to our speakers. Thank you, Nada. Um, our first question is for Dr. Marwan Zidane. Um, so I think most of what was included in the lecture was fairly straightforward. Um, but I, I have a sort of specific question regarding quantitative and qualitative variables that you mentioned. Um, you spoke about how age is usually a quantitative or a numerical, uh, like an exact figure, and it's best represented by how the exact number is represented in years. Um, however, oftentimes people choose, or I've seen people choose to have it represented in their data collection as qualitative ordinal data, which is like by groups of 18 to 30, 40 to 55, et cetera. Um, obviously this reduces precision in a research, um, but from an analyst point of view, um, what are the particular issues you face during analysis of these types of data? And are there perhaps any benefits to using this method? Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Can you hear me? Yep, yes. all good. It's very, very interesting and important question, and I face this uh, frequently, in fact, in my research. Uh, the, uh, usually, as a statistician, as you mentioned in, in the presentation, it's not recommended to categorize a numerical variable because you lose information, you lose power, and you need more sample size to make up that. Uh, so if you don't have a good justification for these cutting points, many researchers came to me and we want to cut the age 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60. If there is no good justification for these cut points, these cut points really affecting the result of significance. If you take 10 to 20, uh, uh, 30 to 40 versus 40 to 50, 50 to 60, or uh, 20 years interval instead of 10 years, the significant result and the proportion, the chi-square uh, result, it might change. So uh, if you don't have good justification for these cut points, I don't recommend categorizing it. How, however, in some other situation, categorizing is, is recommended when it is clinically valid and makes sense. Sometimes I, 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 I'm not uh, really interested in the real uh, HAP1C value, but I want to know whether it's uh, below seven or above seven, whether it's controlled or above control. This is meaningful for me instead of comparing the mean between two groups. One mean is uh, six and the other is 6.5. If you have large sample size, it might be statistically significant, but clinically it's not significant. I'm interested whether it's control or not control. I want to compare the percent of people control the HABUC versus not. For sometimes it is recommended. It is uh, really makes sense. Uh, for it, it really depends. If you have a valid justification for categorization, yes, go for it. And it's my sometimes recommended. If you don't have a valid justification for categorizing, I prefer to keep it in numeric and see the effect of the age on any other outcomes as a numeric. There is no need to categorize it. Yes, categorization might make the analysis easier, more appealing for presentation, yes. But as I told you, it's affected by the cut points. Sometimes older, younger, if you have good cut point for to compare older with younger, that's maybe justified. Uh, but uh, big random cut points for categorization, this is really 
risky. Yeah, I, I, I makes sense. I mean, uh, the, the the message basically I'm getting is always talk about the research question. And I think this resonates with uh, something Dr. Sunil mentioned in the chat while we were having our webinars. It's important to talk to your biostatistician before you start I, I, your data collection, right? So, exactly. uh, so that you don't make those mistakes and you know what's going to be statistically or clinically relevant. And you don't want to answer the wrong questions and just confound the issue. So exactly. that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'll Thank have you, uh, another and ask the next question. Right. Thanks, Dr. Magavan. So our next question <laughs> is for Dr. Sunil. So within literature reviews, particularly systematic reviews, which you mentioned, authors often utilize subgroup analyses that basically address outcomes within selected studies from the reviews that have similar traits, like you gave us the uh, example of the Titus Media paper. So when you analyze these subgroups, they'll give you more homogeneous results compared to from the whole package of studies. And it may make sense in theory, but given the fact that these subgroup analyses were never part of the original research question, and so they didn't undergo the same rigorous protocol and scrutiny in the review, what potential problems do you see arising from the use or elaboration of these subgroups and systematic reviews? And is there any way to improve their use or should they be avoided altogether? So can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. So that's a great question. Um, Subgroup analyses are risky in the sense that they are often generally supposed to be used as exploratory means of doing a hypothesis exploration, but not necessarily answering a question that hasn't been already defined in your primary review. Now it is, it is legitimate to do predefined subgroup analyses, but you don't wanna to do too many of them because at some point if you're doing a primary review and you're doing, I don't know, 20 or 30 subgroup analyses, by chance alone, you might find one that is significant. Uh, so you have to be a little mindful of that, especially if the numbers are not that robust in the various subgroups you're looking at and your sample size isn't big. Then if you start to put all these numbers into a forest plot, your confidence intervals become wide and you run the risk of having spurious uh, results with high heterogeneity or <clears throat> whatever it is. So a, 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 a clean rule on such thing is keep your subgroup analyses to, think, to small numbers that are clinically relevant or at least biological plausible and what have you. I was just uh, checking on some things with uh, regards to that a little bit. Um, there, there are some rules around how to do subgroup analyses as well uh, in different study designs. Uh, BMJ in 2015 had an article by somebody named Burke uh, that we can send along if needed for such things. Uh, the grade group also is diving deeper into how to do subgroup analyses in a uh, thorough, transparent, and credible way. Uh, the challenge with subgroup analyses is if, if your subgroups that you're pulling out of the papers that you've searched for and retrieved and made your filter cut based on quality appraisal uh, has information, that's fine. But there may be articles out there that if you didn't rigorously search for those particular subgroups, you may have some missing information that that's a, a, a bias and a threat on us search and selection bias uh, relative uh, early on in your project. So it just, you know, answer your question or your primary questions, keep your subgroup analyses to a minimum, and you should be able to avoid any traps with regards to getting into um, unjustifiable conclusions based on um, untrustworthy subgroup analyses, if I can put it that way. Okay, absolutely. I think a lot of what you said makes sense, and especially the parts about having missing data when you look at the subgroup analyses of the information that you only have. So I think it's an important point to keep in mind, and hopefully in the future, if we have more um, standardized ways of doing subgroup analyses, then they might be of use to uh, yeah. research. There is, a, there is a small section in the Cochrane Handbook online about uh, just some uh, rules and, and uh, cautionary commentary about doing uh, subgroup analyses and making sure you don't okay. fall into uh, bias traps or false negatives, false positives and what have you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Samuel. Yep. Yep. I think, I think that's good to know when reading systematic reviews as well, that the subgroup analyses are not going to go through the same. I mean, they're, they're more of a convenient sample, if, if, if anything. Uh, if you're looking at it, don't look at it with the same 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 eye as the actual systematic review because they didn't go through the same protocols. They just sort of had a grouping yeah. of data based on what you wanted as a result. 
right? And the same problem, if I can sort of carry on a bit, uh, this can happen in primary trial so, uh, studies like randomized trials. So many, many years back in the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine, we did a critique of a randomized trial in Europe on using vasopressin in cardiac arrest. And they did, I don't know, a couple dozen subgroup analyses on their data because their primary outcome was negative on vasopressin versus epinephrine or other drugs for cardiac arrest in out-of-hospital settings. Uh, however, they found in one of their 20 some odd subgroups, um, there was some hint that vasopressin in, I don't know, I'm going to say um, asystolic women above an age of this, like I'm just going to create this nonsensical subgroup, uh, showed some uh, benefit. And there was commentary after that that said, stop the presses. We need to go back to rewrite all the ACLS guidelines over and over. And we, we wrote a critique in Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine saying, look, the numbers in this two by two table that you're, you're purporting this conclusion on are very small. Your loss to follow-up was substantial. And we plugged those loss to follow-up numbers into every cell of the two by two table. And in most of those cells, if we put those missing patients back, we could negate that outcome and even if we did one person across the different cells, we could negate or reverse that outcome. So that was a seriously flawed subgroup analysis that thankfully did not lead to changing ACLS protocols for pre-hospital out of uh, hospital cardiac arrest, because you know it, it's a piece of flawed information or faulty information that has substantial policy changes uh, in clinical practice worldwide. And so thankfully that didn't happen, but there's the risk of such things that, and this is, this is where the scientific literature gets risky all the time. And COVID is a perfect example of these types of things when it comes to prevention, health measures, masking, vaccine benefits, vaccine efficacy across different groups and on and on and on, because there's a desperate uh, quest to find groups of people who benefit from these things so they can then inform policy statements. I'm not here to criticize the COVID literature. We could go on for days about that, uh, but uh, it's it's a risky game. So you have to be a bit of an educated consumer and caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, or let the reader beware is really the takeaway. I think that there's also a conversation or basically an argument to be had, which we can address, of course, in future modules about <laughs> the fact that the fa uh, people chasing these outcomes or these positive results is, is, is a result of journals not accepting anything that's negative. So having negative studies being being healthy as part of the entire academic you know, project would, would probably inevitably allow people to be comfortable with the fact that, okay, we didn't find something. Um, but I mean, that's a whole conversation for another time, I think. Um, so wrapping that up, I have a, another question for Dr. Marwan. And uh, I, I feel like this is more of a nitpick than anything else, because when you talk about types of variables, like we said, we could just probably sit here for hours and talk about all the different types of categorizations mm -hmm. and different nomenclature surrounding variables. But one thing supposedly sort of stands out in the list of um, or the index of the types of variables, so to speak, uh, which is um, something called a time to event variable. Now, this sort of confounds quite a few of us. Uh, apparently, a time to event variable has some unique features uh, with a kind of a neither here nor there status in the categorization of variables. Um, with your expertise, is there any way you could briefly summarize what this type of variable is, why it's a little bit different from the others uh, you mentioned, and its importance, uh, which is ultimately the goal here, if any, uh, in research data? Yeah, thank you for your question. Yes, it is. It is it's a very good question. Yes, it is different. It is continuous and numerical in nature because it's time. But it's different from the uh, uh, regular uh, numeric variable it, it, uh, in the status of it. It might occur, it might be censored during the study period. So it's time to event, we monitor something to have a time to die for, uh, for uh, cancer patient or time to break for a certain machine in engineering. So we follow up and to see how long it takes for the event to happen. Sometimes this event uh, during my study is not happened. It's continue working, the patient is still alive. So in this case, the event did not happen. The death or the mortality does not happen. The breakdown does not happen. The remission does not happen. So in this case, we call it sensor. So uh, in this case, I can't use the regular analysis to compare. I want to cooperate this 
patients or these uh, subjects who are still censored. I didn't observe. So we include them in, uh, in the analysis using the survival. This is uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curve to see what's the probability for a colon, for a patient, uh, cancer patient to live more than four years or less than three years or more than five years. We use this survival curve and also we use uh, Cox regression to see what factors affecting this time to event, the lifetime for the, uh, for the cancer patient or the lifetime for this machine or uh, the time to event for anything we are continue observing. So it is in general in numeric and in, in nature, but it, is, uh, it might happen, might not happen. Uh, sensor and if it in this case the ha this is how it is uh, different from the numerical variable and we use another kind of analysis which is survival curve and survival regression by Cox regression. Uh, makes sense. I, I think it's important to know this slight caveat because yes. mortality is such an important outcome in most you know observational studies, interventional studies, you know, RCT, right. so to speak, especially when we're talking about drugs interventions or um, retroactively looking at things that might have affected that. So it's one of the most important things when we talk about resuscitation and uh, uh, other things, right? So um, it's important to know. Thank you very much for enlightening us about this. Yeah. Um, we do not have any more questions at the moment, but it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, uh, that about brings us to the end of uh, module four for the research work plan. Um, thank you to Dr. Marwan Zidane and uh, Dr. Sunil Badie for two amazing uh, lectures. Uh, and thank you to all the audience and participants who took the time out and in, uh, well, hopefully enjoyed, joined in today. Um, please don't forget to follow the link in the chat box that uh, I believe uh, has been put up and should be on the screen as well. Uh, fill in the feedback form to download your CME certificate. Um, and that's all from me, over to you, Nada. Thanks, Anza. So on behalf of the entire team of ECRAM, I would like to thank both our speakers for their time, cooperation, and valuable contributions to this academic initiative. Thank you, doctors. And thank I'd you. like to thank Tasneem, our host, for working the magic behind the scenes. And thank you to each and every member of the audience for your participation. We hope this module will help open vital conversations surrounding data and literature reviews. And we'll see you all soon for module five of the research work plan where we shall discuss all things related to data analysis. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye Dr. Sanil. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you all. Nice, nice meeting you.